Soil, one of the most complex structures known to man. A living, breathing ecosystem that is host to a quarter of our planet's biodiversity. Healthy soil gives us clean air and it filters our water. It provides us with our food, our forests and our wildlife. Without soil, there can be no life on Earth. It's as important as the air we breathe. It does so much for us. It's where our biodiversity lives. It's what gives us our food. It's what cleans our water. It's where all our archaeology is. I mean, the history of humans is really the history of interaction with the soil. Is oil soil the same? Because to me, it, it looks kind of the same everywhere. No, far from it. Soil is made up of different sized particles. There's sand, which are larger particles. There's silt, and then there's clay, which is smaller, flat, smooth particles. And the different combination or the different proportions of those particles in your soil decides what type of soil it is. In Ireland, we have 213 different soil types and each of those will perform and behave a little bit differently. And really appreciating and understanding those differences can help us to devise management practices that can really get the best out of those soils. We're using an awful lot more of our land. Is the soil being harmed by that? Yes, it's suggested that soil erosion and soil compaction are the two biggest threats to soil quality in the European Union, obviously in addition to sealing in terms of new pavement. In 2014, a UK study found that Britain may only have 100 harvests left in its farm soil. Now that's a truly shocking result that may force us to think about our precious soil as a finite resource. So David, 100 harvests left, that's 100 years of crops. That's a very frightening prospect. It is. We've conducted research on soils and we find similarly that our soil nutrient reserves are being diminished, are being mined uh, over time. And we currently have 90% of our soils, our agricultural soils are suboptimal in terms of pH, P and K, so nutrients. Over millennia, rain, wind, sun and ice all help convert rock to soil. Nutrients such as carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus are then stored and recycled within that soil to provide food for our crops to grow. So how do we find out about the health of our soil? We're standing here in a pit. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the perfect ways to have a look at the soil in situ. We have this upper horizon or A horizon, and you'll notice that that's darker. So that's where our carbon is stored. And we see here, we have a large abundance of roots in here. For a, a good structure, we want to have something like this. There's more pore space and more room for both air and water. So it's important actually that it's crumbling, it's letting in the air, it's letting yes. in the worms can work around it. Yes, in this part of the soil it is very good. We can also see here we have a, an old wheel mark here and in this part of the soil over here the soil is a little bit harder. You can see it's not yeah. breaking down into that small crumb. When we move down a little bit further we get into what we call the B horizon. So this is closer to the original rock okay. that the soil was derived from. If I, I just jab in the knife a little bit, you can see here right under this wheel mark, it's very, very compact, mm -hmm. very, very dense. So that damage has been uh, conveyed deeper into the profile. It's quite hard. Okay. If you try to, to break those. Mm. Oh gosh, it's like a rock almost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, that is a problem and a lot more harder to, to remediate. Right. So I find this fascinating. Purely by driving over this little section here, we're actually damaging the potential of drainage. So if we get more rain, this section of the soil isn't going to be able to get rid of that water. Exactly. And you might not think of it, but it's the living creatures that live and die within that make soil hospitable for other living forms. Some of the most important actors in keeping our soils healthy are our wriggly friends. A worm will consume somewhere in the region of 20 to 40 tonnes of soil per hectare per year. Wow. They are truly nature's plough, very, very important for opening up the soil in terms of pore space. In a hectare of soil to the top five centimetres, just down to about there, you have a million and a half pores being generated by earthworms. So, so we actually need to have the earthworms. Really, really important. And earthworms. how many earthworms 
would it take to run a farm, basically? Uh, studies that we've conducted and that has been uh, conducted elsewhere shows that the stocking rate, so if we have a, a stocking rate in terms of animals on the surface, there's equal amount of worms underneath the soil okay. in, in terms of weight oh, by wow. quantity. Worms and plant roots help to create wide channels in the soil called macro pores, but there are also large areas with micro spaces between the grains of sand, silt and clay. Part of Sarah's research focuses on that proportion ratio across different types of soil. Soil that has a lot of macro pores can transmit raw water very readily. It might be more prone to nutrient losses such as nitrate through leaching, mm -hmm. but also it would probably be very good for tillage. It would easily supply water to the plants. If you have a heavier soil, it's going to be a lot more poorly drained. So Sarah, your research directly relates to what farmers will be doing on the land around the country. Yes, absolutely. Our specific mission is to look at the water quality of Ireland and how agricultural land management affects that water quality. And you think, well, why are you here in soil research then? But the thing is that soil and water are so intrinsically linked to one another that you can't really understand one without studying the other. Sarah uses a device called an infiltrometer to measure how much water can drain through the soil at a given time. She drives a bladed ring into the ground until it's completely flush and this creates a sealed chamber within the soil. Sarah then fills the chamber with water and the rate of this water moving into the soil is measured using a pressure transducer. That allows us to tell how much water is being infiltrated into the soil over time computer runs the mathematics on it and then it gives us out the values of hydraulic conductivity. So we know that soil structure impacts water retention and conductivity, but Sarah and her colleagues at Chagask also want to find out how soil structure impacts on the microbiology of the soil. Katrina's meeting Fiona Brennan to find out more. Fiona Brennan is a soil and environmental microbiologist based in the labs of Chagas Johnstown. Many people would think of soil as an inert substance, but actually the soil is brimming full of life. The whole soil is alive. And more than a quarter of all organisms on the planet are found in soil. Wow. So in terms of diversity, it's amazing. So it's all, it's kind of bacteria, fungi, all the microbiome that we kind of think of in terms of humans and what we're starting to understand there, you're starting to understand that in soil science. Exactly, just like uh, humans have a microbiome, uh, organisms associated with them, uh, soils also have it. And in fact, soil is much more complex than anything we found on our, ourselves. Fiona is investigating how the microbial community in the soil is affected by compaction, which can occur through the pressure of a tractor tilling the field. She collects samples from compacted and uncompacted areas of the field, freezes them in liquid nitrogen and brings them back to the lab to extract the DNA profile. How many microbes do you expect to find in a sample like this? Well, a healthy soil can contain more than 100 million bacteria, believe it or not, and uh, 50 kilometres of uh, fungal mycelium. So it's just mind-blowing. Mind-blowing! First thing we need to do is uh, put them in the, the bead beater there. Bead beater. Bead beater. And off we go. Fiona and Aoife clean and filter out contaminants and chemicals from the DNA, so they're left with a tiny sample containing the pure DNA code, which they mix with coloured dye to help visualise it. And they're even giving me a go. So I suck up the DNA. Yeah. No. I think you have it. Do I? Oh yeah, I do. See it? God, it's such tiny amounts. <laughs> and then suck up the dye. Oh, mix, mix, it, mix it in with the dye. So push it all the way down. Yeah. Perfect. And um, you might give it another little mix because it's... Still a bit of a blob there. Yeah. This is my first time though, come on, give it a Yeah, care play. Oh God, you're such patient people, scientists. Mm, I think I'm going to miss it. Yeah, I'd say now that one... Great very job. Much. I yeah. think that one, you, you will discount that one and go <laughs> off and leave this one. So this is the gel actually that we've taken from the tank and we have it visualised under UV light. And what you can actually see is the bands of DNA there at the top. That's the shiny light things. It doesn't look shredded or anything, and it's fully intact, a strong band, so we've, the extraction has worked really well. Okay, so this information is telling you there's X amount of bacteria and X amount of whatever fungi. Exactly, and what we do then is we try and tie this in with process data. So when we're looking at a particular transformation in soil, changing one, a nutrient from one form to another, we actually want to replicate that in the lab. 
and we'll give them idealised conditions and then see how much gas they will produce under different conditions. So they give off different greenhouse gases depending on what they're exposed to? Yes, exactly. And the real strength is combining the different parts. We have the microbial, we have the actual gas being produced, and then we can link that back to the physical and the chemical information that David and Sarah have got from the field. And is the ultimate aim to kind of create a model where you're able to say, well, in County Cork, we expect these kind of microbial communities based on different physical constraints? That would be the dream. <laughs> and hopefully in my lifetime, maybe we'll see it. It's a long way off yet, but that's exactly where we're hoping okay, to Okay, so hit. come back to you in like 25 years time? Absolutely. Okay, 25 <laughs> years time, grand. What can we do to mind our soil? I think the most important thing is not to degrade the physical structure. So for farmers being careful that they're not damaging the soil by either heavy machinery or animals out in the soil and um, maintaining their pHs. And in general, making sure that we're not over applying chemicals or uh, insecticides or pesticides. And even uh, old farming practices that have somewhat gone out of fashion, like liming your soil, can be really important in terms of the communities that are in, in soil and are, are great for keeping a healthy microbiome. So giving your soil some tender loving care, really. Exactly. And also you and me in our gardens, we can also be mindful of the soil and uh, look after it in a way that... It well, I just leave my soil alone and never touch it, so that's my well, way that's of doing it. Well, that's probably a very good way of doing things, <laughs> Katrina. And actually, when soil is left alone, it uh, often does very well. Oh, I have a really healthy soil population, <laughs> so I'm fine. Good. <laughs>so while we probably think of the visuals, the cows, the farmers, the grass, etc., mm -hmm. we should be very grateful about our soil as well. Absolutely. For all the work that you see above the ground, there's just as much work going on under the ground.